Wild Blue Yonder, part four. Who's excited? All right, grab your Bibles, every location, church online. Uh, bring uh, that faith with me into a Bible study we're going to do on the life of John the Baptist. Two places I need you to turn. Turn to Malachi 3, where we find an Old Testament prophecy about John the Baptist. I like to call him J the B. Uh, when you uh, see Malachi speaking, he's, he's writing, just so you know, 400 years before John showed up. Uh, but, but we're going to look at that. And then also, if you grab a second location, you could put your thumb there, then, then turn your way to Mark uh, chapter 1, where we find uh, John the Baptist actually showing up. Thank you, worship team. Um, the title of my message is Rethinking Runways. So if you'd like to take notes in church, which I think is so helpful, jot that down. Rethinking Runways. Provocative title, right? And we're going to look at John the Baptist. Before we do that, um, we're in a series, as, as you know, uh, those of you who have been with us, uh, called Wild Blue Yonder. And if you're just jumping in now, it's all about risk. It's all about us challenging the status quo and saying, let's boldly go where no one's gone before. Let's, let's, let's see something new. Let's step out in faith. Let's, let's risk again. And we're challenging everything. And we're saying what, what we've seen has been amazing. The vistas and the horizons and the beauty, what we've experienced, what we've explored thus far is fantastic. And we're praising God for all of that. But we're just not, we're not, we're not giving up yet. We're not hanging up our spurs. We're not going to rest on our laurels. We're not just going to talk about the good old days. We're living in the glory days. These are them right now. And we're saying, let's, let's see a new chapter unfold. Let's see something brand new. Let's, let's, let's pick a new fight. Let's take some new ground. That's Wild Blue Yonder. And since we've employed such a, a bombastic metaphor as space, because that was what drove the campaign, you know, Wild Blue Yonder, and, and uh, the, 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 the beauty of space has been kind of what we've been using to inspire us. And the launch pad kind of metaphor, 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, that kind of, that, that kind of language has been all throughout. And uh, since we've done that, I figured it would be helpful for us to talk to someone who does that not metaphorically, but like literally every day. And it just so happens uh, that I happened to meet an astronaut recently. Um, I was in College Station, Texas and uh, at an event, and an uh, astronaut was friends with uh, Louis Giglio, who I was speaking with at this event. He came up from Houston, uh, where he works for NASA, and met him in the back room. And he was so sweet, he gave mission patches to my girls from his mission he was on. And, and uh, I, as we were going through this, I was like, I got a million questions for He gave me his number. He made a huge mistake and gave me his number. And, <laughs> Do you need anything? I'm like, I'm preaching about space. I need everything. I need, give me book recommendations. Tell me what documentaries to watch. Is this real? I'm checking my stuff. You know, on it's pretty good. Be able to fact check it with an astronaut, right? And and so I figured it would be helpful, you know, to to, to talk to him a little bit. Uh, so I actually invited him to come and, and speak to us. And and he said, Well, I, you know, I got a simulation I got to do in the pool, and there's, you know, it's, I can't, I can't do that. I said, Okay, well, fine. Would you get on a Skype call with me and just talk to our church a little bit about space, so we could just hear what what that is actually like? And uh, he was kind enough to do that. So earlier this week, I had the chance to just sit down and ask him some questions on behalf of all of us. Um, so what you're going to hear in just a minute is a conversation I had with, um, with Colonel Shane Kimbrough. Um, so uh, let me, a little bit about him before we jump in. Uh, he was uh, a colonel in the Army where he uh, flew Apache helicopters during Desert Storm and was a jump master. Uh, and he retired from the Army. Uh, he also went to West Point, so no big deal. And, uh, and, and he, after all of that ended in 2004, uh, was, was recruited by NASA where he flew on the space shuttle Endeavor on STS-126 uh, in 2008, and he was a mission specialist, and he performed two spacewalks, and uh, he also uh, was able to go um, to the ISS, the International Space Station, in 2016 as commander on Expedition 49 and 50, where he took command of the uh, space station and was there for uh, a period of time. Uh, he, during that time, performed four different spacewalks. We threw some of the footage we found because NASA, it's open rights to all the footage. And so during the conversation, we threw on some of the footage. It's all him that you're going to see uh, during this time and, of course, those he was up there uh, with. I'm pretty grateful. Anybody with me that he would take the time to talk to us? So. Uh, Check out this conversation. Uh, we just wanted just to talk a little bit about what, what you do. I mean, it, it's, it's incredible. Um, your life there, just what I laid out in that few moments, um, but just what, what you do every day and you guys and everybody at NASA. One of my favorite quotes um, just on the subject is, uh, 
uh, from John Glenn who said, I went to the moon, but 400,000 people supported at NASA, and so we all went to the moon. And so maybe I guess we could just start off with, you know, what has been being a part of uh, space exploration and the International Space Station, all that, what has that taught you about teamwork? Well, uh, it's, I mean, it's paramount in what we do and, and kind of alluding to what John Glenn said there. We are uh, a part of this huge team, but really a small part of it. I mean, there's so many more people, thousands of people that we're standing on uh, and representing when we get the chance to fly into space. And we're also depending on them. We're depending on them for training, um, for working on the vehicle, making sure that they get our vehicles ready to go and that they're safe so that we have the opportunity to launch into space and actually return back to our families. So not only we have you know, so many people looking out for us and, and thinking about us and our families, not just their, their um, you know, daily grind that they're doing, uh, it's pretty special and a wow. special place to work. Okay, so all, all things said and done, you've flown currently at Tanout to space twice. You spent all together upwards of six months in space, right? It was 189 day, 173 days the second time and 15 days the first time? Correct, yeah. Let me ask you this. Your family wasn't with you, but they, they were a part of the mission in the sense that they sent you. And I, I think for so many of us in life, you know, there's areas where we don't get to be hands-on a part of something necessarily, but we still can support behind the scenes. What did your family do that best supported you from Earth? You know, my wife, Robbie, was absolutely amazing. Um, she, of course, ran the show when I was gone. We had three children. Um, it was a tough time. I mean, there's never a good time to leave for six months, but our, we have girls that were starting freshman year in college at the same time I left, so my wife literally lost three of the five family members within a week. Oh, my gosh. Um, with me leaving and those two girls leaving. Just an uh, amazing job that Robbie did uh, to keep our family as normal as possible. And so we, that's what we wanted to do before we left. Robbie and I sat down, and uh, of course, um, a lot of prayer was coming from them and other people to, to help and a lot of support around the community. But uh, Robbie in general held everything together. Uh, we talked every day, even when I was in space, which was amazing to be able to, to have that technology. That's amazing. And you were there Thanksgiving, you were there Christmas, and so, I mean, just thank you so much for that sacrifice that you and your family made. But um, you're on your T-minus, you know, two-minute countdown, and they've told you to snap your visors down, and they've told you to turn on your flow of oxygen, and you're on the Cape Canaveral launch pad, and you're, you know that within two minutes, you're about to be shot on top of a rocket. Yeah, I'm getting excited while you're just talking about it. <laughs> it's such an incredible time. What's going through your mind? How does that feel? What is? I mean, we're talking about risk in this series in our church, but what is? That's that's risk right there. What does that feel like? Yeah, I felt completely calm and ready to go. I mean, it was amazing. I was kind of getting pumped up and hyped, but in general, I was just sitting on my back like that's the position you're in when you're strapped in, and I felt complete peace uh, and calm and like that was exactly where I was supposed to be in life at that time. Uh, obviously, many many years of training. And preparation went into getting to that moment or those moments, um, and I just knew I was in the right right place at that time. I knew I had plenty of people praying for me and my family, and um, that you know there, there were tons of risks, obviously, that you brought up involved in those moments. But uh, I didn't think about those. I, I trusted my training at the time, trusted my equipment, and trusted my crewmates. Um, and it took a while to get to that point. I didn't. It just didn't happen overnight. But uh, over the years of training. And uh, with my crewmates and with the equipment that we were using, in this case, all Russian equipment, the most recent flight. Uh, so I got very comfortable with all that. And then once you get to that point, uh, I just felt very comfortable and was ready to Gosh. Go accomplish the mission. That's amazing. I love that. All the hard work, all the preparation, a big team effort. But then once, it, once it's there, it's go time, that calm that kicks in. That's, that's so inspiring. The... Um, the close quarters of the space station. I mean, you've only been home eight months, so it's still fresh in your mind. You lived in outer space. Let's, you lived in outer space for six months. That's crazy um, and, and amazing. And you're, you're flying around 17,500 miles an hour, or as I read, five miles per second. That's how fast the space station cruises around 16 sunrises and sunsets a day. But close quarters with five other people. You had, a, you had a French colleague, I think, with you. I think I have a photo of, of uh, one, one of your guys there with you um, from France. You had two from Russia. You had another American as well. What, what is that like on just the ability to dynamics of dealing with people around you in intense situations where literally life and death is on the line? 
Yeah, it was a great challenge, and uh, started out, we knew it was going to be challenging, uh, putting you know any type of people, doesn't matter if they're all the same, but put you in a small area for a long period of time. In general, there's going to be you know conflicts that arise. We do a lot of training uh, beforehand to get you know uh, for us to get to know each other a little better. Obviously, they put us in these survival school situations, and me being the commander, um, I kind of looked at those events uh, a little differently because I really had to manage the entire team when I was up there. Uh, but bottom line. Everybody was a go-getter on my team. Everybody worked super hard, thought like I did. Uh, we were putting the mission first, and we were putting our personal things. Any personal thing you wanted to do would be done kind of outside the normal working day. Uh, but it was just really interesting and very cool to be a part of all these different cultures, like you mentioned, and to learn, you know, to celebrate Russian Christmas versus the U.S. Christmas, and to celebrate, you know, European and Japanese events um, that I didn't even know existed. And just to be part of, of those activities in a crazy environment like space was really, really special. All right. Eight months back home, what do you miss the most about the space station? What What do you think of the most fondly that you you know, you, you, you miss? Uh, absolutely. Just looking out the window at planet Earth. Um, we have pretty amazing windows up on a space station. Not a whole lot of them because we wouldn't get a whole lot of work done. I think we have a whole lot more windows. Right. Uh, the, the module you see behind you there is called the cupola. And that always points directly to Earth, and it's a module full of windows, so uh, it's just a special place to be able to hang out. So we didn't have a whole lot of free time, but when we did, we usually find ourselves in the cupola taking beautiful pictures of planet Earth or just enjoying the view that we had. It was such a unique and special view to be in that module, uh, kind of going around the Earth as fast as you mentioned earlier, five miles a second. Well... I can't thank you enough for taking the time to talk to us a little bit about your world. Um, I think um, we are all at Fresh Life so grateful, and um, what you guys do is amazing. Uh, I thought maybe before before we uh, said goodbye, uh, maybe one last question. Um, you know, there's there's a lot of young people in our church and a lot of older people in our church just with dreams in their heart. And I'm sure for you, as I know, as as a young boy, you began dreaming about becoming an astronaut. Is that right? That's correct. Yeah. Um, you know, just at, I'm sure at certain points along the way, uh, that dream seemed pretty unlikely, impossible, maybe even. Um, you know, and there's dreams that we have in our heart. We believe God's put in our heart as a church and as individuals. You know, maybe maybe there's a, a fresh life for this meant to be an astronaut or whatever it is. What advice would you speak into someone who is at a point where maybe the dream that that they've been given uh, just seems impossible and 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 how would you speak to that person? Uh, there are many, many times this door to being an astronaut was shut for me, uh, but uh, I just persevered and, and got let me down a different path for a while, and I kind of came back to um, you know looking for this dream of being an astronaut, believe it or not, in many ways. But the timing, of course, is not going to be your own in general, so just be patient. Um, God will have a plan for you, and you know, we don't need all of you at first life to be astronauts, believe it or not, uh, but we do need all of you to be you know, positive role models for society in general. So try to reach whatever your full potential can be. Um, and along the way, you know, you're going to have ideas on what you want to do, and you know, the doors will get shut, and guess what? New ones will open, uh, and you'll be amazed if you're lucky like I was. Um, you're going to come back around to your original kind of dream that you had maybe even as a kid um, at some point and get to do it. So just you know, work hard. Uh, and being nice to people, it seems like a simple thing to say, but it just doesn't happen a lot in the workplace. So um, I encourage you all to do that, and you'll be amazed at the doors that God's going to open for you. Gosh, that's amazing. Okay, I said one. I said that was the last question, but something you said there just prompted me to ask one more. Landing in this, you come down and you land on, I think, Edwards. You guys landed at Edwards Air Force Base? When you landed at Kennedy Space Center, but the weather was really bad that day, so we went to Edwards Air Force Base. Down. Okay, so landing, I mean, I saw the footage. I mean, it's boom, shoot out the back, and then it's just nice. You pull up to the gate, you get off, you get a massage, you have a cup of coffee. Uh, your second time around, landing in the Soyuz capsule here, that is quite a bit different of a landing. I heard one astronaut said, landing in the Soyuz is like 15 explosions followed by a car crash. That's a great description. I don't know if you said that, but that's, that's really good. There's probably a reasonably good chance that you're speaking to someone who in their life has just had a not-so-soft landing. It was not a like this. It was a, you know, 15 explosions followed by a car crash. So that person who maybe sits at church this week trying to maybe pick their life up a little bit, hoping to find God, and what would you say to them just speaking of, 
you know, advice on getting back up after a hard landing? I'll say you're not alone. Um, as much as you probably feel you're the only person ever that's had that situation, uh, I will guarantee you that is not true. Um, and so we all go through things, no matter how good everybody looks, maybe at church on Sunday, people are all going through things and struggling. So uh, you're not alone. Uh, God is there for you for sure. He is always consistent, always the same. Um, and you got a lot of help. There's a lot of people that can help you. So I would encourage those folks to seek out friends, seek out uh, people like Levi there to help you get through whatever situation it is. Come on, let's thank God for uh, Shane and... And let's thank NASA for facilitating that conversation. Things you never thought you'd say in church, I guess. Uh, hey, um, we got a message from Malachi 3, and then we're going to jump into Mark chapter 1. Um, Malachi 3, verse 1, uh, he, he says this. This is the Italian prophet, Malachi. Uh, he says, he says, that's a joke, people. Look. Everyone say, look. I'm sending my messenger on ahead to clear the way for me. Someone say, clear the way. <laughs> Suddenly, out of the, Blue. that's convenient, the leader you've been looking for will enter his temple. Yes, the messenger of the covenant, the one you've been waiting for. Look, he's on his way. A message from the mouth of God of the angel armies. This is a prophecy from the Old Testament looking forward to Jesus coming. But before he would get there, what Malachi is saying is that there's going to be someone who's going to come to get things ready first, an opening band, I guess you could say, someone to do the, the hosting segment and to get uh, the people's attention ready so that when the, the main act comes out on stage, that everything is primed and ready to go. And this is all going to happen after 400 years, although he didn't say that. This is going to, there's going to be a waiting, there's going to be a time of preparation, and then all of a sudden, out of the blue, someone's going to come. Um, so that's pretty cool. Now we see the fulfillment of it in Mark chapter 1. If you turn over just a few pages uh, to Mark chapter 1, we could have picked Matthew, we could have picked Luke, we could have picked John, because all of them talk about uh, J the B, which is pretty epic. Uh, but I like Mark's account because look what he says. He says, the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Then he says, like it was written in the prophets. Which prophet do you think he's talking about? Well, he's about to quote from Malachi, which is awesome. I'll show you these two are connected here. Behold, now this is the New King James Version, so a little different translation, but same, same, same idea. I send my messenger before your face, who will prepare your way before you. Out of the blue, he's coming to get things ready. Now he quotes Isaiah, so it's prophets plural, because Isaiah talked about Malachi also. Awesome. The voice of one crying, I'm sorry, the, Malachi, Isaiah talked about John the Baptist also. The voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord. Make his paths straight. John came baptizing in the wilderness. So that's interesting. He came out of the wilderness, out of the blue. Out of the blue, he came out of the wilderness. Guess what? You can't just be used by God out of the blue. You have to be willing to go into the wilderness. John the Baptist, the Bible says, as a young man, made the decision to live a life in the wild. And because he made the decision to live a life in the wild, then he was able to be used by God out of the blue. I think we have got a whole generation just wanting to be used by God out of the blue. Just, oh, I want the instant career. I want the instant everything to be right. I want depth of character without having to work for it. I want savings, but I don't want to save. I, I want to weigh less, but I don't want to eat less. I, 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 want to, I want to be used by God out of the blue, but unwilling to live a life in the wild. Let me just tell you something. If you want to be used by God out of the blue one day, you got to make a decision to live a life in the wilderness. The middle seat ain't fun, but it's necessary. All right, so it says he came in the wilderness preaching a baptism of repentance for the remission of sins. Then all the land of Judea and those from Jerusalem went out to him and were all baptized by him in the Jordan River, confessing their sins. This is beautiful. This is revival. This is he gets up and he preaches out of the blue one day because he spent his life in the wilderness with God, alone with the Lord. And, uh, and God blesses his ministry. People are coming from all over. The I, love, I love that he didn't go to Jerusalem, didn't go to Rome. He's preaching nowhere. He's, he's preaching out in the sticks. He's pre but people are flocking to him, right? This is, this is, this is uh, I feel the dreams right here, man. People don't even know why they're pulling off the interstate, to James Earl Jones would say. They're, they're going to come to you. They're going to come to you with dreams in their heart. They're going to come to you. If you don't get it, it's on Netflix at the moment. Feel the dreams. If you build it, 
he continued uh, in verse 6. We're given some details about him. Now, John was clothed with camel's hair and with a leather belt. Because why not, really? You know, you can wear anything. <laughs> and he's on a strict Portland diet, diet. Look, he ate locusts and wild honey. This is and single origin coffee. <laughs> Connecting the dots for all of our locations, right? And he brunched hardcore on Sunday, right? Verse 7, and he preached saying, there comes one after me who is mightier than I, whose sandal strap I am not worthy to stoop down and loose. I indeed baptize you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. Come on, it's pretty good. It's pretty good opening act. John the Baptist's job in life could be summarized in one word, runway. You heard at the end of the interview that, that Shane talked about their first shuttle mission having originally been planned, as is the custom, to land at Kennedy Space Center. But instead, they were redirected because of weather. NASA, you could say, had to rethink the runway. They were going to land somewhere. They had to choose to land somewhere else. Well, John the Baptist's job was to, to be about the runway. He was to build a runway so the Messiah could come. He showed up, and he wasn't the plane, but he was the one to prepare things so the plane's landing could come in safely. And that's really the heartbeat of Wild Blue Yonder. What's this series all about? Well, we just happen to believe that God has some great and mighty things that he wants to do in the coming days. And this series isn't that, but we're getting ready for it. We're preparing. We're making straight the way of the Lord. We believe that God wants to go before us. We believe in 2018 and beyond God's going to do great things in new places and new horizons and new vistas and more people and more miracles and more salvation and more stories and more power and more glory and more strength and more honor and more outreach and more. And we're, we're trying to get things ready. This, this series is our expression of faith saying we believe God's not yet done working in Fresh Life Church. And yeah, it's great he worked the last 11 years, but we're thirsty for more. We're ready for more. We're going to position ourselves for more. And so we, we could do no better than to look to John the Baptist as an example, because his life was a runway. He's a living run. John the Baptist was a runway model. <laughs> Not just because of his curious fashion choices. Although, you ever watch a runway model? You know, you're like, what in the world? That's, that's not practical. You can't even fit under a door with that hat on, right? <laughs> And he had eclectic choices and clothes. I'll give him that. But I'll tell you what, it's not just that. It was the life in the wild. It's being used by God out of the blue. It's being willing to get along with God and get a depth of character so that he could be used miraculously. I'm telling you something. It's the secret things that no one sees. It's responsible for the public things that everybody pays attention to. It's what you're willing to do in secret that allows God to bless you openly. It's, it's being alone with God on your knees that allows you to rise up out of, out, out of out being seemingly blessed as an overnight success, right? But I, I like what Biz Stone, the founder of Twitter, said. He goes, he, goes, he goes, you know, passion, perseverance, hard work, blood, sweat, and tears. And you, too, after a decade, can be an overnight success. I, I think that's John the Baptist. Wow, well, look at the man. man. Just shows up one day and preaches. And man, God's blessing him like crazy. And he'd be like, yeah, there was a decade alone in the wilderness eating bugs. But yeah, sure, it's easy. Yeah, great. Everyone, everyone should be blessed like me, all right? And, must be nice and, and, and fine. They hate you because they ain't you guys. Okay, so, so listen. So, so, so John the Baptist was a living runway. And since we're trying to build runway, I, I thought it would be helpful for us to look a little bit at him. Here's kind of the big idea of this message. You in your life will yield only to the extent that you're willing to clear the field. You see, planes can't land where there's no runway. A plane needs a runway to land. Every plane needs some sort of runway, even if it's just one of those planes that can land. It needs a clear space. It needs to have obstruction free. Even a drone needs a clear space to land. Don't talk to me about it right now. I'm still sad because I broke my drone in the Bob Marshall wilderness. I crashed it into a tree first hour I was in the Bob. First time ever being in the Bob. I don't even got proof that I was in the Bob. I couldn't text you. There's no service in the Bob. I went to the Bob. I broke my drone on a tree because I tried to land it where there wasn't a runway for it. 
There wasn't enough space to get it down. Planes can't come down if they don't have room. And check it, God's power is kind of like a plane. And that's why 2 Chronicles 16, 9 says, the eyes of the Lord go to and fro on the earth. What is he doing? He's scouring. Where can I land my power? Where can I land? Is there some runway? Give me some runway. Clear the field. Make some room. Give some space. Build your faith. Show me you got some obedience. Take me at my word. See if I'm not good. I want to show my power. Look at it. To those whose heart is loyal to me, or upright towards me, or straight toward me. Why did John need to get people's hearts straight? Straight, because a plane can't land on a zigzag runway. A plane needs a straight way. You got to clear the way. Come on, someone say, clear the field. Come on, shove your neighbor, tell them, clear the field. In your marriage, in your life, in your heart, we got to clear the field for God to land his power. We got to make some room. We got to give God some space. If we build it, he will, hey. Mow down your crops. You know what I'm saying? Like, you got to get Kevin Costner on it. If there's a dream and you believe in it, are you really connecting this, Levi? Oh, I am going to connect it all day long, because I just watched it. It's in my spirit. So, and I like how Darth Vader's in the movie. It's just, it's just can't leave. Anyhow. <laughs> Every movie, James Earl Jones is in. I'm like, oh, Darth Vader's in this one, too. It's, and he's in the Bible, the Jesus of Nazareth. He's one of the wise men. It's the funniest thing ever. <laughs> James Earl Jones as a wise man. I, I love it. All right, so I'm getting distracted. Um, so we're trying to make some, make some runway. Uh, because the bigger the plane, the bigger the, say it. So not all runways are created equal. Remember when we were talking about how, how uh, Space Shuttle Endeavor was going to try and land at Kennedy? That's, Kenway. That's Kennedy runway. I mean, it's very small uh, in, in the picture. It's always it's an inch long. Uh, that runway is a football field long wide. Several miles long. And that's where Kennedy normally lands there at, at Cape Canaveral. And uh, yet, Shane said their space shuttle uh, could not land there because of inclement weather. So they went to Edwards. And this is the landing at Edwards, which is the longest runway in the world. It's seven and a half miles long. It's in a dry uh, riverbed or lake bed that they, they made this runway. It's partially paved. And uh, it's, it's incredible. Now, now you, you go, OK, they were going to land at Kennedy. And instead, they landed at Edwards. Kennedy, Edwards. Kennedy, Edwards. Kennedy, <laughs> Edwards. They were going to go to Kennedy. They undocked from the space station. <laughs> and the calculations involved to, to make that change, by the way. Just think about that for a second. Because we're coming down, inserting into a spinning world. We were going to insert in the atmosphere and not burn up, hopefully, and land at Kennedy. And instead, we do the tabulations, hidden figure style, on the chalkboard. And we land at Edwards, all right? Now, you think, oh, that's no big deal. They just, it's like going from Salt Lake City to Phoenix. OK, let's get our bearings here. Look at this map. Kennedy is in Florida. <laughs> Edwards is in California. Here's my question. How many runways did they fly over on the way? It's not like there's no other options. I mean, your city's got a runway. My city's got a runway. Every city's got a runway. Some cities got multiple runways. But why'd they fly all over, over all those different runways on the way from Kennedy to Florida, from, from Florida to California? Here's why. Because not every runway works and is suitable for what they needed to land. The space shuttle's got unique needs, guys, right? After it lands, it's not like it can just be refueled and sent out. It doesn't have an engine. It's got to get back to the launch pad and be put vertical and be attached to all the things that get attached to it. It needs an enormous building. It needs a crawler that can crawl it out in the vertical position out to the launch pad. So they need an Air Force base where they can load it up onto the back of a 747. <laughs> so here, here's the thing. Edwards Air Force Base has a machine that can pick the space shuttle up, lift it up, and, 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 and a 747 can be driven under it. So the runway there is suitable. And at Kennedy, they don't need to do that because they got the launch pad there. So as, they, as their eyes scan to and fro, they didn't see any of the other runways in the middle as viable options. 
And, and what we're trying to do in the series, in the season in our church, is we know that as God scans the 2018 and 19 and 20 horizons, he sees things that he's capable of doing. When God doesn't do something, it's never because he wasn't powerful enough. Oftentimes it's because we weren't willing to be a part of what he wanted to do, so he does it through someone else. What we're trying to do is posture ourselves with length of runway, with a cleared field, with the right things in place for God to do through us what he's capable of doing, what he has said that he will do. We don't want to miss out on a thing. We don't want to close our eyes because we miss you, babe, and we don't want to, someone said, what space movies have you been watching as we've been going through the series? I said, Armageddon. I asked Shane about all the different space movies. I said, E.T., realistic, unrealistic. He's like, um, I'm going to end the call if you ask me anything more about that. <laughs> I did ask him about The Martian, though, and he did say he grew lettuce in space. So I was like, that is realistic. I said, did you use your own feces, though? Yeah, that's, that's what I really need to know. Um, he said, I, I don't want to talk about it. Uh, so <laughs> he, he, here's the thing. I, I want to give you three quick things. That, that I think God wants to drop into your life <coughs> if, if you'll just put the runway in place. Number one, significance. These are all from John the Baptist. Number one, significance. When, you're, uh, when you clear the field, God can land, and, and, and then you're a part of all that he does because you did that, just like John the Baptist. Now, he's out of the story. He wasn't there for the lepers. He wasn't there for the raising of Lazarus. John the Baptist wasn't there for the feeding of the 5,000. He didn't get to be a part of any of the subsequent things because he was dead. His life ends. He's in the story, baptizes Jesus, and he is out of there. All right? All he, all he was given the task of doing is preparing the runway. But guess what? He was a part of everything that God did because he was a part of anything that Jesus did. Because he set things up for Jesus to do this, didn't his life take on a whole new significance? Just like anything you or I eat, if we eat that, that energy becomes a part of us. It then is a part of us doing everything we do. John the Baptist had the good sense to do what we are supposed to do, be digested into the body of Christ. And then we get significance because we're a part of something that will outlast everything. Talk about transcendence. Talk about immortality. When we lose our lives, we find it. When we lay it down, we respond. Receive it. I'm telling you something. Jesus said, no one who's given up houses or lands or fields or anything will not receive back more than a hundredfold and eternal life. There's a significance to being a part of what Jesus does. And let me tell you something. As we all give, as every one of our families and individuals and even children in our church come next weekend to do what we do at the end of every year, and that's to give an offering for expansion, regardless of the size of your gift, there's a significance to your gesture. There's a significance to it, so long as it's done in faith, so long as it represents an honest sacrifice. We're not talking about equal giving here. We're talking about equal sacrifice. Because for some of us, we've been blessed with more. We've been entrusted with more. If, if, if I gave it the level of some of you, even though it takes faith for me, it might be a very much smaller gift than your gift because you have more you've been entrusted with. And for others of you, you might feel like, well, I'm not going to give anything because it's such a small amount. What difference would it make? You might have the attitude of, of the disciples when they found the five loaves and two fishes. We found this food, but what difference will it even make? It's such a little amount in light of such a great need. You might look at such a great need and what does it cost to build a campus and how many millions would it take to, to resource the church like it needs to be to do all the things that we're called to do. And you might make the mistake of not giving anything because you don't believe your gift can do everything. But that's not how the space shuttle gets to space. It's a million different parts, a million different pieces. What did John Glenn say? It was the 400,000 at NASA. And what if any one of them said, well, my part's so dinky. I push one button here, or I just install this here, or I just check that safety. I'm not the one in the shuttle cockpit. I'm not the one gloriously launching off. Well, when one part of the whole fails to do its job, what happens? Disaster. Yeah. Columbia and Challenger, anyone? The two deadly disasters in the space shuttle program were caused by two small pieces not doing their job. Wow. One was just a piece of foam, and one was a faulty ring and a cold day. And I'm telling you something, when, when we don't all do what we're called to do, regardless of the size of what we've been entrusted with, when we see a significance to it, because we're going to give a sacrifice. If you've been entrusted with millions, give out of that millions. If you've been entrusted with thousands, give out of the thousands. If you've been entrusted with hundreds, give out of the hundreds. Well, I'm challenging the youngest child in our church. If you have $20, give out of that $20. Let it be a sacrifice to you. But don't use the word faith and don't use the word sacrifice if it isn't. Right. But don't give to God that which costs you nothing. 
Otherwise, let's call the series Wild Baby Pool Yonder, right? Let's, let's call it Pee in Our Diapers Yonder. Let's call it Shallow End of Life. But if we're going to call it the Wild Blue Yonder, let's give a gutsy gift. Let's take a step of faith. Let's, I, I want to be challenged. I want, us all to I want us all to see God do something great. <laughs> now, y'all are clapping, but most of you don't give. And, and I only say that because it's true. We look at our cities that we have church in, and here's the percentage of people who give at our church based on attendance. We drill down on individual gifts we give versus attendance, and here's the, the cold, hard numbers. Uh, the newer campuses, of course, we expect to see some time before people get the revelation and get the idea of giving and receive and get, get sick of just consuming and want to contribute. That's maturity, by the way where you get sick of just consuming and receiving, and you want to actually be a contributor. So we understand there's, there's always been a journey in the 11 years we've seen that. But we see the even most successful in terms of those who come versus give anything. And I'm not even talking about biblical tithing. I'm just saying give anything, gifts at all, we see being very low. The majority of people are content to come and receive, but not contribute anything. And you know what? You don't ever have to give anything, ever, in the history of our church. You never have to give a single thing. You'll always be welcome here. You, this will always be a place where people can hear about Jesus and hear about God. You never have to give anything. But what breaks my heart about this list is the 89% of people in Billings and the 92% of people in Great Falls and the 97% of people in Portland. And even at the most successful, oh, great, look how great Whitefish is doing, 60 uh, gosh, math is not my strong suit. 73% of people are not giving in Whitefish at the most. And so all across our church, 13% of people are doing the heavy lifting so that 80, is it 7%, 7 of people can receive that. And that's just tragic that so many of you are missing out on the blessing of what God wants to do. And if NASA worked that way, if 87% if of the equipment there was malfunctioning in that way, would we have gotten to the moon? Will we get to the Mars, as, as, as Shane tells us, we will in our lifetime? And so that's not to slam down. That's to encourage you to take a step up and say, OK, you know what? I'm not going to sit here at the kids' table. I'm going to be a contributor. I've been blessed by this church. My family is better because of this church. I sure as heck am not going to let other people only give. I'm going to do something. But I've heard the reasons. Well, this church seems to be doing fine without my money. This church needs money less than I do. I, and I'm telling you, it's not about us, the church needing your money. It's about you needing God's blessing. And you need the, the faith step it takes. And it's not about, well, what we're doing has been paid for. It is. But it's about what we could be doing if we all stepped up in that way. Significance will be what you find as you make runway. Second thing, endurance. Endurance. Yeah, it was awesome. John the Baptist, man, he preached and people got saved and revival, right? But here, here's the thing I found. The moment God makes your platform bigger, instantly your life gets harder. Sometimes people ask me, what's been the biggest surprise in ministry? And I always tell them it's the fact that you can be experiencing the best of times and the worst of times at the exact same time. As Jen and I talk back with our team about 11 years of church here, every significant period of expansion has been matched equally and oppositely uh, with uh, a period of, of great antagonism and a great conflict. And it, it, if you look at the scripture, it's the exact same for everybody. Paul said, a great door of opportunity has been opened, but now there are many adversaries. It's Nehemiah saying, let's build a wall. And instantly, he's got people saying, he's the worst. He sucks. If someone jumps on a wall, even a fox is going to knock down. Let's kill him. Right? And he's like, whoa. And John the Baptist, no different. The, the moment he begins to be used, and instantly Pharisee, Pharisees start showing up talking crap on him and, and all this. And you don't have the right. And we, what are you doing here? And, and he was just like, y'all are snakes. Right. I, I want to write those emails, too. I want to write. I'm gonna, I'm, I don't let that get into my Twitter feed because I want it to be holier than John the Baptist. But the guy was like, you brood of vipers. Who invited you to preach? Get out of here. Right. <laughs> he's the best. Um, he's my he's goals. Twitter goals. is. One day, I'm gonna, the whole Lord's going to let me tweet like John the Baptist preached. And um, I already got a camel hair coat. I got it in Manhattan. I'm excited. I'm on my way. I am ready to go. All right, so, so <laughs> you need endurance is what I'm trying to say. I want to warn you, if you're going to take a step of faith and surge towards serving in the church, surge towards giving in the church, if you're going to make decisions that there's going to be habits in your life that you feel like are obstructions in the runway from what God wants to land, Maybe you realize, you know, yeah, you have the liberty to drink, but you're, 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 you're addicted. 
and you can't, you can't cope without four or five beers a night, and you just see yourself getting angry. It's affecting your family. It's affecting your work. You say, you know what? I'm going to clear the field. I'm going to make some different ch- choices. I'm going to get around me some different friends. If you make some choices in your marriage, you make some choices in your schedule. If you start clearing the field for God to move, clear that 30 minutes before you rush off to work to have some time of devotion. You clear the field because you know that your life's only going to yield to the extent that you clear the field. There's only going to be the inundation where you make accommodation. Right? God wants to deluge glory and power and his presence into your life, but you're only going to see it to the extent that you make the space for him to move. Let me tell you something. The moment you clear it, hostility. The moment you clear it, something's going to break. The moment you clear it, someone's going to be mad at you. The moment you clear it, something's going to happen. Difficulty's going to show up. Trial's going to show up. Why? It's the enemy trying to get you back to how it was before you took the step of faith. It's the enemy trying to get you to say, you know what? Let's just go back. This is crazy. This is too hard. This is not what I signed up for. I thought if I served God, jelly beans would rain from the sky and Skittles would fall from, come up from the ground. I I didn't know that it was going to be hard. Yeah, it's going to be hard. And I want you to understand, but God's going to give you the endurance for the next step of faith. He's going to meet you where you are. He's going to give you the grace and the strength to make that next step of faith that you're going to be called to take in the midst of that one. He didn't give us the strength and grace for while beyond or during blood and thunder. He didn't give us the grace and strength of blood and thunder during multiply. He didn't give us the endurance we would need during while blue yonder during let it be. But as we've taken the step of faith and we've taken that step of faith and we've drawn a line in the sand and we've said, we're going to expand. We're going to go to Utah. We're going to go to Oregon. We're going to be willing to reach out. And when people don't like it, and this is not what I thought, we say straight runway, straight one way, runway, one vision. If you don't like it, we're going to focus on the mission, like Shane said. That's how we handle personnel problems. You don't like this, you don't like that, here's the mission. Here's where we're going. People stranded in sin, finding life and liberty in Christ. You don't like it, cool, not for everybody. We're all in. This is what, focus on the mission. The disciples want to fight about this, and Jesus is like, focus on the mission. The disciples always want to fight about this. It's about more fish getting into the boat. All the fights that break out on the ship, not, the, not, not going to be the story here. The story here is going to be more fish in the boat. And that's how we get through it. But God's not going to give you the endurance for this step till you take that step of faith. Derek Carr, uh, quarterback for the Oakland Raiders, he signed an incredible contract, a league-setting uh, contract, $25 million a year, $125 million in all. And he was asked, what are you going to do? Uh, with this, this payday. And the, the response surprised many people. He didn't say, I'm going to coat my teeth in gold. He didn't say anything about Disneyland. Here's what he said. First thing I'm going to do is I'm going to pay my tithe like I have since I was in college. Back then, I got $700 on a scholarship check, but I tithed on that. So that won't change. I'll do that. First 10% automatically to God. Tithing isn't just 10%, it's the first 10%. If you give the last 10%, no faith. That's giving God leftovers. We choose to live on leftovers. We honor God first. That's what he was saying. Now you're like, well, I'd do that too if I got $125 million. No, you wouldn't. Not if you didn't tithe on 700. Not if you couldn't say, I'll live on 630. And God gets the first and the best. That's how you get the endurance to take the next step and the next step. And that's how God is able to bless you with more. And that leads you to my third thing that God wants to land in your life as you're willing to make runway, abundance. Abundance. God wants to land abundance in your life. And check it, God is able to. Isn't that what Paul told the Corinthians? He said, and God is able. Someone say, God is able to make all grace, say the next word out loud with me, abound abundance, abound abundance toward you, that you always having all sufficiency in all things may have, say the next word out loud with me, an abundance for every good work. As we make runway, God is able to land provision. As we make the space, God is able to provide for you like he wants to. And that is within the context in 2 Corinthians 9 of him telling them to show up at church every week with something set aside in proportion to what they've received that week to bring to the house, to bring to the work, and then offerings above and beyond that. And within the context of him telling them, Paul telling the Corinthians, make that runway, he told them God's able to bring the provision. Your job, runway. His job, the plane. You focus on the runway. His job is to make sure the plane lands on time. He's able to make all grace abound toward you. But if you want to walk in God's abundance, you have to be willing to clear the field in obedience. 
You're like, this is, we have gotten way off the track here, Levi. We started off in Malachi. You're talking about John the Baptist. Now you've twisted this thing to end up with money because you just want more money. And this has nothing to do with Malachi. We are not even talking about John the Baptist. OK, OK, let's just, for a second, you want to go back to Malachi 3, where we started with John the Baptist? Go to verse 8 of Malachi 3, right after John the Baptist. Will a man rob God? Yet you've robbed me, God says. But we would say, in what way have we robbed you? In tithes and offerings. You are cursed with a curse, for you have robbed me, even this whole nation. Bring the tithe into the storehouse, that there may be food in my house. And try me now in this, says the Lord of hosts, if I will not open for you the windows of heaven and pour out for you such blessing. Is that not abundance? Such blessing that there will not be room enough to receive it. And I will rebuke the devourer for your sake, so that he will not destroy the fruit of your ground, nor shall the vine fail to bear fruit for you in the field, says the Lord of hosts. You see, this whole thing of runway, as he promised this would come, one of the most important things for them to clear up was their lack of runway in their withholding the tithe and their failure to bring offerings. Why would that be so important? If the runway needs to get made, why is the instant connection made by Malachi to financial runway? Well, here's how Warren Wearsby put it. He said, when people start to decline spiritually, one of the first places it shows up is in their giving. So it's a litmus test for how on fire you are or not on fire you are with God. Why? Because Jesus put it best. Your money is inseparably connected to your heart. Invest in Google tomorrow. And what will happen the next morning? You'll wake up and see how Google's doing, because you're invested in it. So it is. It's true. So I see elbows going. Not, no elbows in church. But whatever you're invested in, you care about. Whatever you're invested in, you track. Whatever you're invested in, you spend time on. You give thoughts to. So you want to be invested in the things of God? There's an easy way to do that. Create the financial obedience of runway so God can bring the abundance he wants to in your life. He can make it rain. I'm telling you, we just have to be willing to do the faith work to, that, that, that happens first. Now, you're, you're saying to me, why would the, the church always focus on this at the end of the year? Is it because we need the blessing? Now, I would say this. No, you, you need God's blessing more than the church does. Because we're, again, our bills are paid right now. This is about future work that we're not even doing yet. This isn't to, to pay for ongoing ministry. It's so we can ratchet it up and make it better. But again, at the end of the day, it's not even just about what we're going to build as a church. It's about what God's going to build inside your heart. It's about what God's going to build in your family. I like how Jensen Franklin put it. He said, a God who paves heaven's streets with gold isn't going to go broke because you don't give him a tithe of your income, but you might. And that's that promise from Malachi. He said, not only will I open the windows of heaven and pour down blessing on you, but I'm also going to rebuke the devourer. I'm going to cause the, the, the blight that might come upon your field to be turned away. I'm going to put a force field around certain things. Warren Wearsby actually continued in his commentary on Malachi, and he said this. He said, if you don't give God your tithe, that's his, rightfully, a first of everything that the ground produces on this earth that he created, he says, you won't get to keep it anyway. It'll end up going to the mechanic, or it'll go to the doctor, or it'll show up in some bill or some tax thing that you didn't know about. And that's because God's not going to rebuke the devourer when there's not the blessing on your resources. Because when you give God the first, the rest of it's blessed. When you don't put God first, none of it's blessed. So you're walking around with money that's not blessed from God. And so it's going to end up leaving your life no matter what. And so I just think it's a better way to live, not out of fear of some bad thing happening, but out of faith that everything that God has given to us is a gift. And we're going to put him first in the tithe and honor him beyond that with offerings that are expressions of our gratitude. So some of you, uh, there's going to be the chance to, to enter into that, that journey of generosity through giving your first offering, because you've been tithing for a while. And through the last years, and you would speak to anybody in the church and say, man, I, I've been walking in abundance as a result of my faithful tithing. And someone would say, well, is that, what does that mean? You're flush with cash all the time? And you would laugh because they don't understand it. They don't get it. And they hear blessing, and all they think is financial blessing, not knowing that that's not the only kind of abundance you can walk in. In fact, Jesus said, if you can't be faithful with cash, how will you able ever to be trusted with true riches? John the Baptist didn't get cash as a result of his runway. In fact, he died penniless in prison with his head cut off. But he walked in abundance every day of his life. Abundance of confidence 
when crowds left him to follow Jesus and his disciples came to him and said, they don't follow you anymore. You were the man. You had the biggest church in town. Now it's all about Jesus. What abundance of confidence was there when he said, that was the plan all along. He must increase and I must decrease. I've played my part. I made the runway. I got the orange cones. I got the plane in. I got it pulled up safely to the gate. And now I get taken out. That's not failure. That's success. I want to spend and be spent to make Jesus famous. That is a man who understands something about abundance. Oh, to have the faith of a John the Baptist, who God was able to make all abundance abound towards him so he had everything he needed to complete his work that God had raised him up to, go, to accomplish. You can have abundance when you don't have when you don't have resources that financially, you can have strength and faith of revelation to watch God make it abound toward you. Or you could be trusted with more and more and more financial things. But the key thing is the true riches that God actually wants to bring by way of peace, by way of joy, by way of strength. My wife was telling me that she thought it was beautiful that the word trail and the word trial have a connection. Because look at the word trail right here. We want to blaze a trail. Well, here's the, the connection. Ready? See that? Trail, trial, trail, trial, trail, trial, trail, trial. See what I did there? Trail, trial. That's payback for the shuttle picture not working. Trial. <laughs> if you're going to blaze a trail, you're going to walk through a trial. So you need the open windows of heaven where you can see God clearly through the open window to have your eyes on Jesus as you walk through the difficult thing that's going to come for you in the coming year as you take God at his word, as you follow his plan, as you launch out into the wild blue. And for others of you who are not yet tithing, so you can't give an offering technically, we have made an on-ramp into this series for you to have your expression of faith. You'll notice on the envelope that you'll bring back next weekend and the card that's inside that you'll fill out, on the second line, if we circle it, there's a line that says, starting now, I want to honor God with the tithe. And so if you're able to bring what amounts to 10% of a paycheck or 10% of a month, or maybe out of faith, you would look back at a year where you haven't been giving God the, his tithe, and you would take a whole year of, of what you've made. And whatever that is, you would bring an expression of your tithe as your wild blue yonder offering. And anything above and beyond that you would want to express, you could say, I'm going to begin this new year in faith. I'm going to begin this new year asking for God's abundance on my life and on my business and on my family and on my children. I'm going to believe God for that kind of a prosperity and the, my cup overflows kind of a life. And so as my expression next week, I'm going to bring God the beginning of my honoring him in that way. Whatever it is, I'm just believing God to speak to our hearts as we gather with husband and wife and families together and uh, make some really hard and beautiful decisions this week about what we are thankful for and how we're going to show that to God. Amen? Yeah. Let me pray for you. Raise up your hands if you receive it. Jesus, I thank you for these beautiful people at our church. Thank you for what you're doing here. We give you all the glory. We say like John the Baptist, we're not worthy to unlatch at your shoelace, and yet you've counted us worthy to be a part of this. And I pray you'd give us the grace and the strength to continue to fight for people who are stranded in sin to find life and liberty in Christ. In Jesus' name, amen. You have time for just one last moment before we, we move towards the end of our service? You can sit down if you want. There was, I'll do two, is that cool? Um, the, uh, <clears throat> the runway length is beautiful when it comes to our blessing. And everything we've been talking about thus far in our service has had a lot to do with our walking in significance, our walking in endurance, our walking in abundance. But that might not move the needle for some of you because you go, you know what, I'm doing pretty good. I have a lot of blessing. I have a lot of significance already. I feel good about my job. I feel good about my family. I already feel this is, I don't, I don't need anything else. If God never gave me anything else, I, I would need it. And I would say that's a good place to be at. But what made me call this message Rethinking Runways was the idea that maybe, just maybe, the planes that are landing aren't just for us. And maybe God wants to land some bigger planes, not just for your family and your life and your marriage, but for other people you don't even know. One of the most important airports in America is the airport in Bangor, Maine. And uh, you ever heard of it? It's pretty, pretty awesome. 
Um, it's a tiny little city, 33,000 people. I mean, talk about Smallville, USA, right? And yet it is one of the most critical airports. And uh, in the last decade, 2,000 airplanes in crisis have landed at Bangor, Maine. Why? They made an enormous runway. It's over two miles long. It's able to handle almost any international wide body jet on the earth. And, uh, and, and they built this airport just way, way too big. They have an international terminal that can process thousands of passengers. Uh, they have standby crews on the ready 24 hours a day. They've been trained in de-icing wide body jets, even though no jets of that size are scheduled to take off or land at that airport ever. Why have they done all this? Why do they have such an enormous airport that's most of the time a ghost town when only 20 tiny commuter planes take off out of, or, or depart out of that plane, uh, airport uh, every day? Here's why. Bangor, Maine is the very first piece of American soil, a plane coming from Europe across 2,500 miles of ocean is going to interact with. And so if a plane has had something go bad overseas, which it does mechanically or whatever, their best hope of not ditching into the ocean is Bangor, Maine. Wow. If we can just make it to Bangor, we'll be okay. Wow. And Bangor realized that, and they saw it as a duty to be where they were. And so they made an enormous runway, not for themselves and not for their needs and not for their family, but for people from countries that they have never been to, for people whose names they don't know, for places they might not ever go. They said, we need a long runway, not just for our blessing, but to bless someone else. And may God help us to be the sort of people who make runways real long, not just for our blessing, but for the blessing of other nations. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much for watching this teaching from the Wild Blue Yonder series. If at any time during this message you made the decision to put your faith in Jesus, congratulations. We are so excited for you and we would love to send you a Bible. Now to receive that, you can click the No God button at freshlife.church and fill out the form there and we would love to get that in the mail for you. Now if you prefer a digital Bible, you can text the word Fresh Life, all one word with no spaces, to 99,000 and we would love to send that to you along with a 21 day devotional through the Gospel of John that Pastor Levi wrote. And if you would like to support what God is doing both in and through the Fresh Life house, there are several ways that you can do that. You can give by clicking the Give button on our website giving via the Fresh Life app, or you can text the word FRESH to 45777. And if God has used this house to work in your life, we'd love to hear from you. We hear stories from people all over the world, and it's so incredible to see how God is working in the lives of people all over. Now, if you'd like to share your story with us, you can click the Share Your Story button on our website, or you can email us at story at freshlife.church. And finally, for this Wild Blue Yonder series, we put together Wild Blue Yonder giving kits for everyone to have just to remember to pray for this series and pray for your year-end offering. And we would love to send you one. They come in this Wild Blue Yonder box. And inside, you'll receive a card with vision and just kind of direction about this series. You'll also receive uh, an envelope that comes with a card that you can write um, your year-end offering on, but it also comes with a way for us to pray for you. So if you want to fill this out and send it back to us, we would love to pray for you. And finally, it comes with a super rad remove before flight keychain that says wild blue yonder on one side and risk the ocean on the other side. And this is just such a cool way to remember to pray for this series, pray for your year-end offering, and just believing alongside us what God is going to do as we launch into the wild blue yonder. Thank you again for watching this message.